Hello, everyone, and welcome to the November 28th, 2020 episode of Pub Talk Live, the live publishing talk show airing the second and fourth Saturday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern. I am your host, Sarah Nicholas. I'm a young adult author, uh, board member, and agent liaison for Pitch Wars and a library event planner. Uh, you can subscribe to Reminders via email by clicking the link in the description so you don't miss a show. You can also follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Pub Talk Live. And if you'd like to support the show, you can find the link to the Patreon near the end of the video description down below. Um, and I am going to, <laughs> sorry, I just got a little distracted by the comments. I'm going to um, go ahead and introduce our guest co-host today. Uh, Margaret Owen was born and raised at the end of the Oregon Trail and now lives and writes in Seattle while negotiating a long-term hostage situation with her two monstrous cats. In her free time, she enjoys exploring ill-advised travel destinations and raising money for social justice nonprofits through her illustrations. So please welcome to the show, Margaret Owen. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Check out my books. <laughs> yeah, definitely show everyone your books. We can, yeah. Uh -huh. I and wrote these. Shiny. <laughs> you can buy them occasionally. Awesome. Um, yeah, and Margaret's website and Twitter and I think Instagram are in the description down below. So you can go find um, on there too. Um, so I just want to say hi to a couple people. Hi, Jay. Hey, Heather. Um, so uh, back last late last fall, the regulars who watched the show like gave themselves a, a fandom name, I guess. Yes. So yeah, they're exactly. called Pubbers. So hey, Pubbers, glad that. you could join us. <laughs> um, Allison, hey, and we also did a Pubbers um, winter gift exchange. Oh. So there's, I guess some people got their uh, gifts. Yeah. So cool. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Heather said hi to you. <laughs> oh, hi Heather. <laughs> All right. Um, so today's viewer poll, I'm going to drop the link in the chat if you haven't yet voted in it yet. Um, since it's been like kind of a stressful year and <laughs> this was a stressful week, I just like kept it really nice and easy for everyone. What do you like to drink while writing or reading? Um, and just like low key. And but I was going to say like non-controversial, but I'm sure the tea brigade will come after me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you don't mess with them. Our, if, even if it's just a matter of loose leaf versus bag, <laughs> that is, I believe that launched a thousand ships before. <laughs> yeah, I, um, it's like a an ongoing thing because I don't really like tea. And so they're always like, oh, no, we have a lot of tea <laughs> drinkers who watch the show. Fair. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to jump right into the news items. A lot has happened in the last couple of weeks. Um, sure has. Yeah. And there's there's actually some good things too. But yeah, mm -hmm. it just seems like this this past two weeks was packed. Oh, um, all right. So we've been talking about this for like months on the show now. Um, but Hachette is the latest publisher to raise their starting salaries in its most expensive locations um, to $45,000 starting February 2021. Fabulous. Yeah. So that's, that's good. Publishers right? keep raising starting salaries, please. <laughs> yes. Please continue to do that. Please continue to hire remotely. I feel yeah. like these are all positive changes that we can be making. Um, and it's going to be like 41,000 in their non expensive locations. So obviously New York oh, city God. is, is an expensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I live in Seattle and, um, boy, the, mm. <laughs> I, I have seen the rate, like I, I now pay about double my rent when I first moved here 10 oh, years ago. Wow. Yeah. It, it's, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it is, yeah, it's a whole thing. It's a whole shebang, yeah. but <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm glad that they are sort of acknowledging the cost of living increase just across the board. So that's great. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking actually, um, Orlando, yeah, it's been about double and I moved here mm -hmm. in uh, 2009. So, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's I mean, it's it's one of those things where the the real important thing about increasing these these wages is it means that people 
the, the formerly the the jobs were only manageable to people who could afford to live on a lower salary mm -hmm. and that automatically excluded a whole bunch of people who just really couldn't make that work for whatever reason and um, you know be, be that financial difficulty be that just financial normalcy honestly mm -hmm. um, and so by by raising the salaries, it makes, I think, not only is it make not only is it good for the employees, but it's also good for publishing to bring in like you know, to allow more people from different perspectives and different like life backgrounds who not, may, may not have been able to make the the salary work before to bring in more fresh voices that way. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a it's a step in the right direction. And I'll take it. <laughs> I also I think it benefits a publisher from a, like just a purely um, like economical standpoint too, yeah. because if you have, if all of your, your entry level employees are either, well, being supported by someone else, which was the case or working another job, like stress, if they so don't stressful. have to work a second job, they're going to be better at their job, you exactly. know? <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> it should be, a, this should be a no brainer. It yeah. should be very straightforward. <laughs> all right. You have some fun news for us. I do. Yeah. So, Romance authors Alyssa Cole, Courtney Milan, and Kit Roca, who was actually two authors, uh, were inspired by Stacey Abrams, aka Selena Montgomery, please buy her books, uh, to help Georgia elect two Democratic senators in the upcoming runoff by fundraising with an auction. Uh, the initiative raised $95,000 before the auction even began, which is just <laughs> ludicrous. <laughs> And then they auctioned off 3,065 items uh, to 1,200 bidders and raised more than $450,000, which is just, I mean, it says a lot about, I think, not just the, you know, the moment that we are in in history, but also <laughs> to the incredible badassery of Romance Landia. Yeah. Okay, yeah. can I swear on the show? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, I we've seen a, a bunch of like, you know, literary au auctions um, if to help different causes and they are all always amazing. And, you know, it's a lot of hardworking folks doing really cool work. $450,000. Yeah, oh lot. my God. <laughs> yeah. That's we so were um, last Wednesday, Bess and I, who was the Wednesday write ins with me, mm -hmm. we were like kind of just scrolling through all the items and talking about yeah. them and like, there, I mean, there's so much going on, but there's like people like the Casey McQuiston had mm -hmm. arcs of her new book up and there, those were going for like quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Laura oh, yeah. said <laughs> so far. Um, yeah. So the auction is, is mostly over. Um, uh, Stacey Abrams donated a Selena Montgomery hardcover. <laughs> Um, and so that's the only remaining item because it was kind of a late donation. Oh, I was like, yeah. I mean, I hope it's the only remaining because the bidding is between ten thousand dollars and twelve thousand dollars. <laughs> it's pretty high. It's it's. I think it, it was over two thousand. I remember how much it was. <laughs> um, but she signed it both as Stacey Abrams and as Selena Montgomery. Oh, <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Just but you can still work. you can still also still donate on the site. Um, yes. So, yeah. <laughs> so they're still fundraising. Um, that that is a good time to mention, by the way, that all the um, news items that we talk about, as soon as we uh, end the show, the links are going to be in the description down below. I just have to like clean them up and copy and paste them there. Um, if you're watching the replay, they're probably already there. Um, <laughs> so you can learn more about anything that we're talking about uh, after the show if you'd like. All right. Here's some more. Um, th this is good news, but it's also like, I guess it's situational, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Depends on the situation. On, I mean, it's because of our situation. So mm -hmm. Joy Harjo will serve a third term as the U.S. Poet Laureate. She is only the second person in the 77 history of the position to do so. She's also, if you weren't aware, the first um, Native American to hold the position as well. So Incredible. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I'm like... Hopefully she gets to travel. You're right. <laughs> I, I am amazed that that is one thing this administration has not managed to get their grubby little hands on yet. So, yeah. <laughs> like, well, it's like, I think it's the Librarian of Congress that chooses it. So that's yes. a help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who must, must just be the, the most furious librarian in the world right now. Oh, yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Yeah, but yeah no, that that's amazing. And I mean, that is, I think, both a testament to her work and um, a testament to the to the excellent taste of the librarian of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have another news item. Um, former President Barack Obama's A Promised Land set an opening day sales rec record at Penguin Random House, which we're going to come back to Penguin Random House in a little bit, yeah. but an opening day record at none other than Penguin Random House, <laughs> holy crap, uh, for, or with more than 8,000 or 887,000 units in all formats. Uh, PRH said that it was the largest first day sales total for any book ever published by the company. <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of books folks yeah. that is an incredible amount of books and I'm, yeah. like, I'm, I'm glad to see you get his money you know <laughs> like, get that coin sir please yes. <laughs> obtain the coins <laughs> <laughs> yeah um I just like can you imagine being the best-selling first i guess first for day best-selling for penguin <laughs> random house which right. again we're going to talk like about in a minute <laughs> i have a publishing now <laughs> like, yeah. that's just oh that is <laughs> That's, I mean, at any publisher, that's already a huge accomplishment. And then, like, then that thing, <laughs> <at your age. laughs> like, let's dial, let's dial that one to eleven thousand. I guess. <laughs> um, I wonder though. I, I didn't see a clarification. Like, does that include both Penguin and Random House history? You know, I wonder about or, that. It's like, <laughs> it just yeah. says that you know, at the company. I'll I will look into that later. But, um, <laughs> you know, if if it's just like PRH post merger, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But hmm, I wonder. Uh, Maybe how, how was the imprint? That might be also a thing. But yeah, yeah we we shall investigate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Speaking of getting your coin, <laughs> <laughs> Alan Dean Foster went public a couple weeks ago accusing oh Disney God. of, you heard about this, right? Mm -hmm. um, of not paying royalties owed to him for his novelizations of Star Wars and also the Alien franchise books. He claimed that Disney has ignored multiple queries from his agents, lawyers, and the science fiction fantasy writers of America who are helping him out with this. Um, Disney is, get this, arguing that they purchased the rights, but not the obligations of the contract. That's not how that works. Which, that's, not, that's super like, not how that works. Hopefully a court strikes this down because that is a dangerous precedent to set. Also that, I mean, especially, I mean, well, okay, so they sold all like, the majority of their little, uh, their uh, YA titles to Little Brown. Yeah. So does Little Brown not have the, the like, that, does Little Brown now get to say, well, we can publish all these books, but we don't actually have any obligation to pay Disney? Yeah. Because that would be, <laughs> boy, that would, that would just be delicious. That would be so tasty. But yeah, um, well, because like, if, a, what, like, once it become a title becomes popular, any publisher could just like sell to a sister company and be like, right. oh, we don't have to pay the author anymore. Which is like that's that's nonsense. That's not how financial law works. Mm -mm, mm -mm. That's not that's not how it works. You don't buy debt and then just I, yeah. It's a whole thing. The, the article is from the Guardian and it's actually pretty in depth. So if you want to read more about it, I definitely recommend that article. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it says yeah. that anyone can sell any contract and not pay. Yeah, right. Like, <laughs> the entire construction industry would just collapse in on itself. Right. And like, even if they try to set it with a narrow thing of like, oh, well, this just applies to books. Um, that basically would create an environment where a publisher could pay maybe in advance and then sell the contract to another publisher to, and who never has any obligation to sell the, or to pay the royalties out. Mm -hmm. And then that just basically undercuts the entire concept of having a contract with yeah. a publisher who pays you royalties. So at that point, they're just like, all right, well, we would like to accelerate people becoming self-published authors. I was going to say, I hope they're ready for all their headliners to it's just yeah. publishing. Because <laughs> I mean, that's just, the biggest thing that a publisher can offer uh, to, to newer authors in particular um, is a platform. They can get like they can get handle marketing and distribution at a scale that no that no one person can, of course. But they also basically like the, the marketing is the big thing there, in that you know they they are the ones who get your book in front of librarians. And mm -hmm. so, if you have a 
existing platform <laughs> that, that you have built with the assistance of your publisher and you have the ability to publish your own books, why would you ever sell them another yeah. book under contract if they're just going to be like, all right, well, in order to get out of these royalty statements, we're just going to <laughs> just hand this over to HarperCollins, I guess. <laughs> no. We're just going to scoot this one on over to Hachette. Goodbye. <laughs> Yeah. Speed, you yeah. Know? <laughs> um, yeah, so you uh, have uh, more publishers <laughs> behaving badly. <laughs> I, I, I'm just witch cackling right now because that's really all you can do. Um, so Viacom CBS, I, mean, I feel like a lot of people have heard about this, but let's just oh, run no, through it. <laughs> you skipped ahead a little bit. Oh, I did. Yeah, I did. Oh, oh, oh I sure yeah. did. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's talk about Albert Whitman, everyone's <laughs> favorite publisher right now. So, um, for context, I uh, was in the same uh, Pitch Wars year as author Joan Hay, mm. who a couple weeks ago came forward with and went public with her issues with her publisher, Albert Whitman and Company, uh, including the. Ex extremely late, dubiously, like, I dubiously accounted, overlooked, <laughs> you know, like, um, uh, basically, they they just neglected to pay her royalties, her contractually obligated royalties, um, for a whole long time, like, well past, you know, what her again, what her contract said, um. So including that and the lack of communication and the failure to revert her rights per a clause in her contract upon non-payment of the royalties. Mm -hmm. um, several authors and agents and even former employees have also come forward to report similar experiences. The company's president penned an open letter to authors that many, <laughs> including myself, <laughs> felt minimized the issues. Uh, in an interview with Publishers Weekly, he also blamed their distributor for a 45 day delay, even though this, A, the distributor stopped working with Albert Whitman at the end of 2019, and B, <laughs> a lot of those royalties have been held up significantly longer than 45 days, sir. Yeah. Significantly longer. Like, I don't know how that, how you explain that. I don't, uh, or the, I, I don't know how that gets back to a distributor issue. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry, Sarah. Did the books not getting on the truck fast enough mean that you suddenly forgot how to do accounting? Like, did you forget how to write checks because the distributor dropped the books off at the wrong bookstore? I don't. I I I got nothing. I mean, yeah. It's just. It is. I have I have spoken privately with other folks in publishing, um, and my you know my personal opinion uh, is that. Uh, it seems like the, given the other financial issues that other authors have raised, like the the owner not telling an author that she won an award, then flying out to the award ceremony, accepting the award on her behalf, and vanishing with the award's money. Yep. Like, it seems to me that the problem isn't the author's, problem isn't the distributor's, <laughs> the problem is the money. And the you know if your model rely if your publishing model relies on basically stiffing authors out of their royalties until or and then and then investing the money that you've saved by <laughs> you basically scam them out of uh, by or you know by funneling that into a, another advance deal you've basically got a publishing Ponzi scheme sir like <laughs> reevaluate your priorities <laughs> what are you what are you doing what what why why would you do this like and yeah. the the deeper frustration there is that it falls back on this I I mean it feels like we've been at a kind of watershed couple of years for publishing where mm. the 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 normalcy of maintaining silence about bad things happening in publishing has you know th that has just shattered people yeah. have come forward about you know abusive people about you know horrible experiences in the workplace and now about publishers stiffing their money and you know it feels like there are people getting sort of pulled into the light by this who have relied on that level of scrutiny being too much for an author to mm -hmm. risk. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I felt very angry on Joan's behalf and um, also just utterly baffled at how anyone would think that that would be a long-term sustainable thing. 
Mm -hmm. And um, it, I mean, we should note that Albert Whitman is is not a newer publisher. It's a very old, no. very established. I have so many boxcar children books. Yeah. <laughs> they they yeah. published the boxcar children. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, again, the article will be in the description later. And it's it's very in depth, and there's a lot of different examples there. Um, I know Catherine Locke has talked a lot about their experience as well. Yeah. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> I feel like it's it's like you don't want to read stuff like this, but like you kind of need to to like educate yourself if right. you're going to be a writer in or, or in the industry. Yeah, I think it's very important. I mean, one of the so when publishing had its Me Too moment, I had not been published yet. Like my my book was bought, it hadn't been released yet, and there were all the like were right right before the water sort of broke on that story as it were um boy that's a gross analogy uh the uh i remember seeing a lot of people sort of subtweeting and saying you know this this guy is known for for preying on young debut authors mm -hmm. uh this you know this, I've, I've heard a lot of people you know a lot of young debut authors who have had bad experiences with this guy and they're subtweeting and they're not naming names and I remember, like, I, I think I ha I said in on some forum or something, you know, I uh, un completely understand why no one would want to come forward and risk, you know, legal action or whatever. Um, well, not or whatever, you know, <laughs> risk risk being caught up in like, you know, uh, a libel case, I guess. Maybe? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, yeah. Um, but I, you know, I totally understand that. However, you have to understand that as a debut author this is terrifying to know that there is someone who is not only so or not only a predator for you know uh, to someone who preys upon debut authors but also is so powerful that nobody wants to name them like that yeah. is that is some scary shit right there but mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's um i mean like a lot of authors do have like kind of a network and they can get right. informed of this, but a lot of authors don't, a lot of debut authors come in. They don't really yeah. have any other author friends, you know, they don't know anyone in the industry and those are the people that are at the most risk, I think. Yeah. As a, um, as a West coast author, one thing that like, if you are not in LA, <laughs> that is that, like the, the number of people who are in publishing who aren't either in LA or in New York or other variations of the East Coast, um, you know that it, it we ha don't have quite as much of a cohesive community out here. Mm -hmm. it, I say out here like I'm not in Seattle, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, you know I'm not exactly out in the boondocks. But you know that's it's definitely less of a an established writing you know publishing community, mm -hmm. and so you don't get quite the same number of robust whisper networks as you do in other locations. Yeah. All right. Well, moving on <laughs> to better right. news. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the national, me. yeah, the National Book Award ceremony is held on November eighteenth. It was hosted virtually by Jason Reynolds, who we are fans of on this show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Case and Calendar won in the Young People's Literature category for King and the Dragonflies, and Charles Yu won for the General Fiction category with Interior Chinatown. You can see a list of uh, full list of finalists and winners at the link in the description uh, after tonight's show. So go check that out if you're interested in that. Um, but that was very exciting mm -hmm. win for <laughs> right. So good to see them get you know <laughs> the awards that I think are long overdue. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is the big one. Yep, <laughs> the big one on multiple fronts. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Simon & Schuster. <laughs> Let's just <laughs> rip that band-aid off. Uh, so Viacom CBS has agreed to sell Simon & Schuster to Penguin Random House, the largest U.S. book publisher, for $2.2 billion cash. Not like billion dollars cash, billion dollars check, you know. not They're not paying in quarters. <laughs> you they're know? not paying stocks. Right. Uh, just pure old cash um <laughs> so simon and schuster or sorry uh simon and schuster is currently the third largest publisher uh in the u.s so there are antitrust con concerns and we're going to come back to that in a bit uh simon and schuster has remained profitable with revenue growing in 2020 but viacom cbs is focusing its future on streaming which is a choice uh the authors guild put out a statement saying that they oppose a sale 
and have asked the Justice Department to challenge the deal. The CEO of HarperCollins parent company also says the sale will clearly be a serious antitrust issue, which I think, so the, the article is fascinating. I think that this has come up. Mm -hmm. um, so for a little background, uh, Viacom CBS is actually sell selling this to not, uh, when we say Penguin Random House, it's basically the company that mm -hmm. owns Penguin Random House, which is Bertelsmann. Which is a German company. Right. Yeah. Bertelsmann, which is German for Bertelsmann. Um, <laughs> and, um, the, one of the things that they cited as um, a potential or kind of a motivation for this wasn't just to make, you know, the biggest publishing rat king possible, but to actually um, try to basically make a Voltron, as it were, to take on <laughs> Amazon, which, you know, I went through a lot of emotional cycles there yeah. of like, okay, I, I, the Voltron thing works for me. The Rat King thing doesn't. <laughs> like, you know, the, the, the idea, we're the publishing becoming a giant Katamari of, <laughs> of publishers into like the big one is not good for, for publishing, for creativity. But at the same time, um, tying back to uh, the, well, we'll come back to the, to my first news item with, with Stacey Abrams. Um, the, you know, the, the reality is that they do need someone to be able to, uh, to take on Amazon and mm -hmm. actually muscle around a bit simply because Congress has not broken up <laughs> Amazon as a monopoly yet. And when one company controls 50% of your market for all the industry, mm -hmm. that is not good. Like that is, that is, that is a bad situation. <laughs> and um, going back to, or why, why I'm doing the call back to Stacey Abrams is that I actually wonder if this, I mean, so there's antitrust or concerns that have mm -hmm. been, voiced by many folks, um, I think rightfully so. I wonder if the sale will continue to go through or if it will go to another bidder um, if <laughs> if we flip the Senate via Georgia and <laughs> if we have a largely or a Democratic majority Congress who is willing to take up serious discussions to break up Amazon simply because I don't think like if if the pandemic has demonstrated anything, not only is is Amazon willing to flagrantly violate uh, basically every worker's right imaginable, allegedly I should say. So please don't sue me, Amazon. <laughs> uh, um, but you know, there, it's just it's not good for businesses for one for to have the super giant. Like we, we want to talk about a rat king company. <laughs> it's Amazon at this point. It's yeah. way too many parts that are unified under one umbrella. Yeah, we talked last the last episode about um, the some of the things had come out about Amazon um, doing kind of like anti union uh, activities oh, yeah. and <laughs> on, uh, like proof had come out. Um, I guess I should mm. say because people have been talking about that for a long time. <laughs> You're right. As a um, Seattle resident, yeah, we no. have um, we've experienced uh, Amazon's uh, political maneuvering firsthand although my favorite thing was when uh they got hit with attacks in the city of seattle so they were like well we're going to move our our operations out to um oh why am i blanking on the name um basically the well not kirkland exactly but the the very wealthy suburb right across the lake and <laughs> i was like oh they deserve each other how delicious <laughs> goodbye bon voyage have yeah. fun <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, so obviously I think it's going to be a while because uh, this, this deal is definitely going to be one that the Justice Department is going to look at. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe a while before that deal gets approved or I guess not approved. Yes. <laughs> um, do you remember who the two other bidders were? I remember one of them. Harper Collins and, uh, oh, I was about to say oh, Rupert so three Murdoch. Other, yeah, three well, other. um, yeah. so Harper Collins, I was, I was going to say Rupert Murdoch, but, uh, I think Rupert Murdoch, uh, Murber, Murber, Murber Doc. Rupert Murdoch, uh, <laughs> he owns uh, Harper Collins, so I think he, that would be one party. Um, yeah, and I don't know who the other one was. I just know Bertelsmann. Yeah, the other one was like a um, an investor in, I think a, 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 well, a, a minority <laughs> investor in Harper Collins or something like that. Okay. Let me I'm gonna pull like, it up. Actually, let's see. If this is some Elon Musk, I don't know. <laughs> Elon Musk. <laughs> right. That would be funny. He's oh. going to buy a publisher, then launch that also into space because he can. 
<laughs> so it was, um, oh gosh. Nope, that's the wrong thing. Um, uh, I don't Jay, know. Jay, what remember you have just typed into the chat is my nightmare. Like that is, they are literally building company. Well, actually, so you're not entirely wrong. That actually happened in oh, Seattle. Yeah. Um, the, so the, wow, I just, all the location names fall out of my brain from mm -hmm. not leaving my apartment ever. But basically this entire district, uh, I want to call it South Lake. Yeah, it is South Lake. Um, which I can see from my apartment. So that's doubly embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> uh, used to be this very low income area. They bought all the land and basically put in a whole bunch of really high end, why is my cat look? What is my cat looking at so intently? <laughs> it better not be a spider. Um, okay, <laughs> spider check complete. But yeah, they bought they bought up this whole you know area and kicked all the low resident or the low income folks out, built their headquarters, and then had you know a bunch of you know really high end apartments mm. went up in that space, and now it looks absolutely nothing like what it used to look like. Yeah. You know, it's it's just uh, it's it's it's. Amazon is not great for the for the economy, I think, in the long run. So, th yeah, the top three contenders were Bertelsmann, Robert Murdoch's News Corp, which owns HarperCollins, yep. and Vivendi, who is a, a stakeholder in Hachette. And, and that's also a 20-ounce drink you can get from Starbucks. But <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Have you read Rob Hart's The Warehouse? I have not, but it sounds harrowing already. <laughs> oh, it's, it's basically... Um, it's like, I, I call it an economic dystopia. It's like mm -hmm. a, a company that's very much like Amazon takes over the U.S. economy, essentially. Um, uh, yeah, no. it's it's terrifying. It's It was a really good book, but it's also like terrifying. And now every time Amazon makes a move, I'm like, oh my gosh, Rob. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't warehouse this. Don't right. warehouse this. <laughs> so we're running a little long, so I'm just oh, going to real quick. No, that's all right. Read this um, last news item because I think it's important. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last couple of weeks, authors and publishers have been pushing Audible to change its policy on returns. Currently, readers can listen to an entire audiobook, enjoy it, and return it for full price within a year of purchase. Um, <laughs> Audible then takes back the royalties paid to the publishers and authors. Uh, and uh, they've been um, there's been a lot of movement uh, like against this in the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, so starting in 2021, Audible will no longer take back the royalties if a book is returned more than seven days after being purchased. So they're still allowing people to return them. But I imagine now that they're taking the financial hit, they're going to be uh, a, little a little more. more. Um, <laughs> you know, making sure people aren't abusing. <laughs> right, like a year, a year. Yeah. That's year. like, and they, I mean, matters. and that was the thing is like, people were literally telling, especially indie authors, oh, I loved your audiobook. I exchanged it. Like, why would you do that? Yeah. That's like, I mean, that's like, that's like saying, oh, well, I really enjoyed the, you know, the, the, the beautiful donut that you baked. And I did buy it, or I did get it out of the dumpster. I got it out of the dumpster. But it was really tasty, and you know, and and I did have you know the five dollars to buy a donut from your store. I just didn't. I wanted to yeah. get it for free, and it's like one of the difficult things with these conversations. I'll I'll try to make this short. <laughs> is that um, you know, the you want to be you want to be thoughtful and sympathetic um, to people who are low income. And aren't you know aren't able to or aren't able to afford a lot of stuff, but if you are buying a book or buying an audiobook, and then you have up to a year to return it for full price, that's not like that. That's it's a library. That's it's no, not it's, it's, it's not a source of library. <laughs> um. All right. Yeah. So all that is to say, use Libro FM instead. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> all right. Now we're going to bring on our special guest. I'm very excited today. Um, Rachel Strolley is the teen services coordinator at a library in the Chicago suburbs. She currently is a books contributor for BuzzFeed, covering YA, middle grade, and more. In addition, she runs social media for Y'all Fest and Y'all West. Previously, she was a bookseller for five years, which started the successful blind date with a book program and ran summer camps based off of YA genres and Divergent. And she wrote for the Barnes and Noble teen blog, 
She has been featured in Beach Bitch Magazine and interviewed as part of a piece for the Wall Street Journal. So please welcome to the show, Rachel. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Sorry, we got like half an huh? hour ago. Yeah, sorry we got you on a little bit later. We kind of like chatted for a while about the okay. news. It's all, it's all very newsworthy stuff in the last <laughs> little bit. All right. Well, Rachel, thank you so much for coming on today. Mm-hmm. Um, where where are you joining us from? Chicago suburbs. So. Oh, <laughs> is it cold there? Um, it wasn't too bad today, but like if somebody from California was here, they would be like, "Yes, it's freezing." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's let's put this on the scale. Yeah, let's talk temperature. Are we in the thirties? Yeah, we're in the forties. Yeah, that's Holy. cold for me. <laughs> oh. Um, so I bought this sweater in October that has like little pumpkins all over it. It's so cute, it's like polka dot pumpkins. And there's yeah. literally been one day where it has been cold enough for me to wear a sweater. And like, we're not even talking. Like, I'm a Floridian, so I wear sweaters when it's below seventy degrees. You know, like. <laughs> what it's it's almost December. I haven't been able to wear a sweater yet this year. <laughs> what is happening? Global warming. I mean, as well, uh, yeah. climate change. <laughs> yes. Um. So Heather said hi, Rachel. So um, and Jay says hey. Uh, and Laura, just to follow up on our last conversation, Laura said, I think most readers didn't know it hurt the author because Audible encourages the returns. Yeah, I know a lot of people didn't realize what was what? happening. What? <laughs> Audible encourages the returns? Yeah. Yeah. So great, right? What? Mm-hmm. 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 Excuse me. That's a, whole, that's a whole other conversation. We could, we yeah. could have a whole other show about I'm just- this. flames on the sides <laughs> of my face <laughs> yep. yeah all right um so let's go ahead and get started so rachel how long would you say you've had kind of your finger on the pulse of YA books i'm thinking um, i've i followed you at least for like three years now so yeah so i started book selling in 2012 okay um, and I would say I probably had a really good grasp maybe like three years in because I was always part time. Mm. Um, it was while I was in college. So like five, five solid years cool. of, of really knowing what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> I knew it was more than three, but I didn't know how long. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in the, in the past five years, what have you kind of noticed has changed in YA and also kind of where do you think the category is going? Yeah, um, so I think, well, the main thing is obviously it's more diverse, which is great. Um, the, in, on, in the, like, n- not necessarily negative side, but, like, also it needs some balance put back in, is that it has been skewing more towards the, like, older teen, like, adults who are purchasing YA, uh, and sort of hovering with like solidly 18 year old protagonists for everything, which is great. I love 18 year old protagonists. <laughs> it's a chaotic time in life. Like <laughs> great to read about would also love 14 year olds in YA. Mm-hmm. Um, and books for middle schoolers that are not middle grade, not kids books. Um, cause they want to, there's some of them that want to be reading YA, but just like literally cannot relate to an 18 year old. Mm-hmm. Um, but you mean a 14 year old is about stealing cars and drinking <laughs> <laughs> on the beach? I mean, yeah. maybe they are. I don't know. I don't judge. I don't know. Some of them might be, but there's also some that are like, I just want to read about a girl who's got a dog and is having her first crush <laughs> and <laughs> getting their Girl Scout and Silver Award. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's one thing. I would like more things that sort of cater back to that. Um, But other than that, I think the main thing that has changed is that it has gotten more diverse. Um, There's been less trend chasing, I would say. Hmm. Like it used to be like dystopian self. Everything is dystopian. Cancer book sells. Everything is that, you know, like stuff like that. And now like there will be, there will be some, that follow, but it's not like a huge, like unescapable, inescapable mm-hmm. trend. 
you know, um, like it used to be. And um, by virtue of that, after the dystopian wave, sci-fi just isn't getting caught as much anymore. Um, so that's tragic. I would like to bring sci-fi back. Um, <laughs> you can make anything marketable if you actually market it. <laughs> ah, there's yeah. the keywords. <laughs> funny, funny how that works. Well, uh, I still remember, like, I guess I'm, five years ago, they were saying we can't sell a book with a black person on the cover. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How's that panning out? How many? I mean, how many weeks? How many weeks has been on yeah. that? Like, you know, like, <laughs> it's got to be a record at this point. And so <laughs> it's like obviously that that wasn't the issue it wasn't the the readers aren't the issue there (laughs) the iranian yogurt is not the issue (laughs) um yeah no that is it's always interesting from an author perspective to see trends you know or like or and to see what people think you know is in trend and isn't off trend like you know as as someone who debuted in YA fantasy, uh, it was like right right around when my my book sold was around when they started saying because this was like mid twenty seventeen was when they started saying oh well YA fantasy doesn't sell anymore yeah and I was like <laughs> yeah don't don't tell my publisher that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's ever going to actually be a true statement no yeah I think you know what what they found is that you know what at when we had trends a lot of the books had similar premises Mm -hmm. and what they, I think what they kind of are wrapping their heads around now is that what isn't selling for YA fantasy isn't, you know, it's not YA fantasy that isn't selling. It's the white girl (laughs) picks up a magic sword and saves, uh, saves the world, uh, you know, and overthrows the evil empire. That fantasy isn't selling anymore because there's plenty of it. And, you know, that's, there's nothing wrong with that, but you know, kids don't want if they've already read it and they've already loved it then it's hard to it's hard for a new story to compete with that you know to compete with a story that they that they already read and loved so you just have to find something new yeah well i have a question from ye oldie patreon uh, this is very exciting i've never done a patreon (laughs) question before um it's from patreon supporter lodestar um how was running a summer camp based off a YA book? Did you have to fight hard for approval? Um, okay, so Divergent was the first one that came about, right? Mm-hmm. And so Veronica Roth is Chicago area author. Oh, um, and we had had like a pre-publication event with her for Divergent. And like, I wasn't even a bookseller at that point because I think it came out... 2012, I want to say? Yeah, but when it was... <laughs> when it was on the way, like when we had the Ooh. arts and stuff, I was still a senior in high school. Cause I remember having it in- Oh, I just like, aged a decade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I graduated from this moment. And I'm pretty sure we <laughs> cause I was in, I remember being in rehearsals and having it with me. Um, and, and I missed the event. And so- Oh no. Yeah, it's all right though. <laughs> um, but so the approval process was, not something I was super involved in. Um, it was our owner's idea to do the camps in the first place. Um, me and then um, another girl who was the, who's, who's the same age as me, um, who a, a, a literal infant is, yeah. is what I mean. <laughs> she's a master here now. She's absolutely incredible. Um, but her at the like book fair division, and so the mm-hmm. two of us were really like the co like leaders. Um, mm-hmm of like counselors and um, coming up with stuff. So uh, the owner did the like getting the rights and talking to Harper Mm -hmm. and doing all of that sort of stuff. Um, And then every different day of camp was a different faction from Divergent. Um, Monday you came in, let's see if I can remember it. Oh God. Um, (laughs) Challenge. So everything was like, um growing things um so like we planted vegetables in the little garden um there's a little there's a little like outdoor historical museum um three blocks south of the bookstore um which is where we were able to have camp for the first two years i think um and it's like historical buildings um from like the founding of the town and stuff like that 
Um, but so they had like a little garden that we were able to plant stuff in. And then the next camp, like the next <laughs> one, like the <laughs> camp would plant stuff. The July camp would actually like get to have it as part of the snack. Like it was just like mm -hmm. lettuce. It was disgusting. I hated it. But, <laughs> um, but so like Amity Day, it was like icebreakers because everyone's like friendly and it was like that. Um, we had Candor Day. Which <laughs> Everybody told the truth. Oh, I know. <laughs> Everybody just laid it all out. Um, Candor Day, we did a murder mystery game. Mm. Oh, I love that. We came up with because uh, I was in my my last year, no, my second, my junior year of undergrad, I think. Mm -hmm. and I had a final on the Tuesday because my school ran through June because we were on trimesters. Oh. And we were like, how do we explain why I'm not at camp on Tuesday? And they were like, well, let's just say you were murdered. And then oh, they no. had <laughs> the other counselors killed me. <laughs> I don't know, okay, but like, you know, she's coming back tomorrow. Like she's not dead. Like, you're right. Um, and then that morphed into live action clue um, after that, so, mm -hmm. which I made myself, which I'm very proud of. Um, we had, what was the middle day? Erudite? Hmm. Everybody smart, reads. Smart people. <laughs> yeah. um, so they had like a trivial pursuit type game that was like the testing quiz that I made for them. So it was like five different que trivia questions that they had to answer. They had logic puzzles. Um, Thursday was abnegation, which was the hardest one because it's like being selfless. And I'm like, who the frick wants to go to that camp? Yeah. Like, right. like that all day. I'm like, that's like volunteering, which is like great, but it's like not what you're ex coming into this camp expecting. Right. Um, but the best part of that day was that we um, actually worked with the local um, like animal rescue and oh. like pet food store. And mm -hmm. so he came with rescue puppies um, and brought them to camp, which the oh. parents knew in advance so that any allergies were dealt oh. with. It was fine. Um, so it was that. And then the did you cover up? Did you like cover up all the mirrors? No one could look in a mirror. <laughs> there were I don't think there were any mirrors. It's just like the um and then the last day was Dauntless. Um we climbed the bell tower, like the staircase <laughs> inside the bell tower. Yeah, right. Um and exactly. uh, we had, like self-defense training, I think. Mm. I guess we went and did that. Um yeah, it's been four years since we've done a camp. So like that, I'm surprised I remember as much of it as I do. Um, oh. and that's the one we made approval for because it was a different YA genre every day. Mm -hmm. like, we had a fantasy day. We had a sci-fi day, a historical day where we made it like we did like the making your own butter and that took a really long time, but it was delicious. <laughs> yeah. Um, I learned that one the hard way in grade school. I don't remember what the other days were, but that was <laughs> before because it's just general category and you can't really copyright that so yeah <laughs> cool very cool um so i wanted to talk about your ya book release database um yes. <laughs> which i'm gonna actually drop a link in the chat in case anyone hasn't seen it um oh, yeah i love it um why did you decide to start putting that together because i know that's a lot of work yeah well so i had done a 2019 like Google Sheet. I mm. didn't like not having the covers, <laughs> and I didn't like not really being able to sort stuff. Um, mm. And it was really just for me to be able to keep track of everything that was coming out because I have to do collection development for the library, obviously. Mm. Um, and I wanted to make sure I actually like got everything down because Baker and Taylor does not tell you everything, um, oh, which no. is where I order from for anyone who is not necessarily a librarian and is like, what does that mean? Um, mm. And so, yeah, I had been trying to figure out like where I would be able to do it, where it wouldn't be like a lot of tech mm -hmm. stuff and coding on my behalf, which I am, I cannot do. I took an HTML class in <laughs> my grad school and that's, I can, I can manage <laughs> things to a small, a small degree. Mm. Um, I can't like make it from scratch. And so I was like, okay, well, Tumblr seems to have like the post format that I want. Um, and so I just sort of started adding covers and adding tags that I was like, well, what are things that I might want to find later on? Um, 
and that sort of it sort of grew from there. Um, there's a 2021 now one now too. Um, and then at one point, um, my friend Vicky C Books um, was like, "Do you ever help with data entry?" And I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> I do. I would love that." Um, I do. Uh, yeah. So she she does a lot of the data entry at this point. Oh, okay. Um, and I do. I pay her in books, which is really really good. There you go. The database doesn't really make money, but like <laughs> it's okay. Um, we do have bookshop links on there now, though. So if you ever mm. feel like you're going to order something when you're looking mm. at it, database, you can do it through the links okay. that are on the database. Yeah. Um, okay. it's, it's so useful. Yeah. I mean, it's been uh, helpful for me to like just pull uh, well, when over the summer, when, when of course everybody's books were getting delayed out to, you know, and even just back in spring, um, you know, it was very helpful to see, you know, what should I be planning for? You know, what, what am I, what else is going to be releasing the same week I am, <laughs> which then turned out to be hilariously not, no longer applicable. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> but my, my book got pushed back like uh, two weeks ish, give or take uh -huh. at, you know, like a month in advance. So it was just like, Oh, great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's so helpful to not only see what else is going to be out that week. So you can plan, um, and maybe, you know, make arrangements to work with other authors, but also just to, to get an idea of like what season other people are putting things out in and how, you know, it helps, it helps lay out the landscape in a way that I don't think, uh, people have really, you know, done before. So bravo. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and if there's ever like other tags people want to see, like always open to it. Um, I know people have asked me like, well, why don't you have a tag for like, this racial identity and I'm like, uh, uh, I don't know about that. Still, yeah. I'm still on the fence. I feel like it could easily be used by someone maliciously as a targeting thing. Um, right. So, well, and <laughs> I, I'm not thinking about that. But anything else, you can feel free to suggest, um, yeah. and I will, I will consider. And, again, and of course, it's not like an official in any capacity. Also, I get frustrated with Goodreads list. That's the other reason that I did it. <laughs> <Fair. laughs> Terrible because it's owned by Amazon. Um, the devil. It. There's no other site that has been competing with them. I'm hoping that there's there were a couple that I know have been yeah. like in development and are in beta, and hopefully we'll be able to actually compete and force them to do stuff. Um, right. <laughs> but it's just dreadful until now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a um, there's a new reviewing site, and I forget what it's called. It's Storygram. It's yes, that's the one, and it seems actually like really good because I think what one of the smartest things that I've seen it do is break down. Like it's it's not just a you know five star somewhere in the five stars thing. Oh gosh, we're running short on time. I will make this. Um, yeah, you know, they basically have you uh, break it down by, you know, characters, plot, um, you know, overall vibe, writing style, et cetera, et cetera. So mm -hmm. you get more stuff that you can say, I love the characters, hated the writing style, or, you know, yeah. love the writing style, hated the characters. Mm -hmm. So that, that I think is super smart. More love data. Story. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> love data. <laughs> Um, I have another question somewhere in here. <laughs> Sorry, I'm singing to myself as I scroll through the notes. Oh, um, <laughs> okay. Um, so this one was kind of similar to the first question, so I will make it very quick. Uh, as a bookseller, BuzzFeed contributor, social media maven for Yalfest, book blogger for Barnes & Noble, and team services coordinator, you've seen publishing from a lot of angles. Uh, where do you see publishers frequently missing opportunities? And you know, I think we, we talked about the, the younger audiences for YA and uh, branching out a little bit more, but anything else you'd like to add? Um... I can say for a fact that a lot of times they push the wrong books <laughs> um, and they don't know how to market half of the books that they have. Um, like they don't, there's people, I, there's great people in marketing and publicity at every publisher. Like I guarantee you, like I've definitely worked with amazing people, but mm -hmm. the way that publishing is structured, it is impossible to get the correct books out there like and by correct I don't mean like there are correct books there are right books and there are wrong books but 
there are books that will never go anywhere because mm. they are never mentioned after this initial sale. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and those could be books that a teen really needs. Um, and it is very, it has been very frustrating to see things when people are like, well, why don't we have this? And I'm like, well, we, we, had we it do, we do months. have it. And it didn't get, it didn't get talked about at all. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily the fault of the person asking the question, but it right. is it's a general, an indication of a general problem um, where there's just, the, everyone is sort of set up to fail. And then if you succeed, it's treated as like, a, oh, of course, like. <laughs> oh, oh. We believed in you all along. Yeah. <laughs> like, you knew you could do it. Yeah. So um, that's a that's a big one, um, and I feel like the rise of sort of the I don't know exactly what to call it, but the publisher run, but still wanting to be general uh, platforms mm. is Epic Reads, mm -hmm. um, which I like a lot of the things that they do. Every mm -hmm. list I look at and I'm like, well, here's your Harper book that could have fit on the list that is by your publisher Ooh. that is not on here. And you're instead talking about books. Someone else's. <laughs> right. With that book. Right. Um, and so I'm like, I get it. But at the same time, like. You have to be smart about this. You, The money that you are getting is from the company that you should be promoting. Right. Like there are other mm -hmm. outlets. And of course, like other outlets get shut down like the Burns and Double Team blog did. But like right. that's like that's like a BuzzFeed thing. That's like a, You're right. that was like a Barnes and Noble Team blog thing. Like they, those outlets can talk about anything. You right. can be talking about the books that are in your publisher because mm -hmm. there are books that will never get mentioned by and this is not just an epic reads thing. Like I don't I'm not trying to trash that they do a lot of great stuff. Mm -hmm. A lot of the people on this and it's not it's not it's not them. Um it's it's just again a general problem that has been happening where mm -hmm. books from the in-house are, are are shoved aside for more seen as more popular stuff from others. Mm. Yeah, I do see because I write for Book Riot um, also, and I see um, you see the same books on the same list over and over again, and it's like like I don't think at this point anyone hasn't heard of you know that book. Why don't you put something that's that hasn't got quite a big a push. And then whenever we do lists, I try to put in like less obvious books, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's a challenge too, because the other part of it is those books, when those book covers are in your preview image, that article gets more clicks. Mm -hmm. and Which I feel so like yeah. you have to like balance it out. You have to put like some big popular books on there with some like less popular books. So you, you still get the people drawn in. But then, right. yeah, like, you have to you have to put you have to put like you know the the wicked king in there. To, you know, come for the wicked king. Stay for um, something <laughs> else. <laughs> you know, an, another fairy book, or honestly, like you know, another another book that talks about you know, or like that deals with political machinations. You know, <laughs> get, get descended of the crane in there. Like mm. you know, there there are opportunities, but. Uh, yeah, no, I, I understand um, the need to be. We don't. We don't want to buy this under the cream right now because we don't want any money to go to Alba Whitman. Sure don't. Sure don't. Yeah. Porter Jones' new book next year from Macmillan. The old. Yeah. The, the ones we're going to yeah. buy. Here, let me let me give you the meme images. Descendants of the Crane. <laughs> <laughs> um, the ones we're meant to find. Yes. There we go. <laughs> All right. So we have one last question for you. Um, I ask this of every guest, and it's always the last question. Um. So it's it's phrased very deliberately. So um, the question is, what is the most important book you've ever read and why? And that's with you defining important however you want to. The the opera of emotions that just played out over your face was incredible. Um, I'm buying you time. <laughs> and I feel like even if I, ha if I knew that in advance, like I still wouldn't actually have an answer. Um, <laughs> The to me personally, mm -hmm. 
we'll go with we'll go with the first book that really like I saw myself on the page and therefore like sort of reignited the like everyone needs this feeling, which was already <laughs> that was already a, a thought of mine, but um was Upside of Unrequited by Becky mm. Albertown. Mm. Um which was the first time I'd seen like an anxious fat girl who was always the crusher and never the crushed. I don't know what the, what the <laughs> God, what a mood. <laughs> um, yeah. Who was all like always had a crush on somebody and it never was reciprocated. Um, like, and that was just like, I was just like, Oh, Oh, okay. Okay. That can, that can be, that can be someone who's a main character. That's cool. Cause like, <laughs> I would read books and I'd be like, oh, the guy thinks she's so cute because she's so small, but so nice for her. What's that like? <gasps> yep. Because yeah. um, I, I mean, I, in high school, I was really into like Mortal Instruments and City of Bones and they're like, I was talking mm. about small Clarias. I'm like, what's that like? <laughs> <laughs> You're right. <laughs> oh, he can just pick her up whenever he feels like it. That's cool. So, Great. Yeah, that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to go with is upside. Nice. All right. Cool. Um, so some of the regulars sometimes comment on the faces people make when I ask that <laughs> question. <laughs> so, there you go. One time I'm just going to do a super cut. <laughs> <laughs> just the dawning horror. I love it. <laughs> um, all right. So Rachel, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Rachel's information uh, website and um, I can't remember what is in there. Twitter and Instagram are in the uh, description. So you can go check her out on Twitter and, and her website and all the different stuff she has on her website. You're, you're redoing your website, aren't you? It's Yeah, it's it's up. It's new. Oh, it's up. Okay, cool. Great. Did you get your blog post back? What? Uh, no. Some of them. Uh, I, some got, of them. I got, I didn't. Yeah, I got oh. a very few of them back. Oh, <laughs> I have enough of the guest list saved in my email that I can probably recreate them, but mm. we'll see. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. So you can go check out her website and Twitter and Instagram. Um, and Rachel, thank you so much for joining us today. We're, we just have a couple of things left. Um, so we're going to say goodbye to you now. Okay. And uh, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. All right. So uh, we don't have an audiobook of the week this week um, because. I'm still listening for the awards and not allowed to talk about the books I'm reading, listening to, I guess I should say. Um, so sorry. Uh, but <laughs> I also just, I'm not much for audiobooks. I prefer yeah. to just jam the book straight into my eyeballs. <laughs> my, my scoring is due December 28th. So one way or another, I will be <laughs> able to talk about books I'm listening to again after then. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to talk about the viewer poll. And that was, what do you like to drink while writing and or reading? Um, and so let's go ahead and bring that up on the screen. And I'm going to switch over so I can actually tea? read. I that. love tea, but I voted coffee. Yes. Look at that. Look at the tea brigade. I told you the tea brigade always comes for me. That's true. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I definitely, so I'm in awe of anyone who can drink and write at the same time. I've tried it like <laughs> once or twice. And what usually ends up happening is just like, I'll type, you know, this is a future problem for future Molly to fix. <laughs> and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> um, I, well, I mean, I mainly drink water cause that's just like, I, right. I drink a lot of water, but I do drink coffee I sometimes, drink. <laughs> especially like I loved going to coffee shops. Right. That was, oh, um, I, see, I, I, <laughs> I need people around me cause I'm an extrovert. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I don't drink tea. Everyone who watches this show knows I don't drink tea. I'm sorry. I've tried. <laughs> I um, I do a rather horrific routine for the coffee lovers, but probably a great routine for the tea lovers in that I'll make a single pot of French press in the morning that's just like an enormous pot of French press and drink that throughout the day, which means I do, in fact, microwave my coffee like a monster. Uh, <laughs> but um, My dad does <laughs> <laughs> right i mean like no regrets i i have no standards <laughs> but um i'll i will basically finish that up in the early afternoon and then in the late afternoon i will have one final mug of tea uh which i will just brew myself um mm. and it's usually just loose leaf but in one of the little scoopy ball things you guys know what I'm <laughs> but yeah no that that's I it just yeah. it's so much caffeine it's so much caffeine it cannot be good for me but boy it produces books 
I do. I very occasionally I'll drink wine or beer while I'm writing as well. Um, I, especially when I started writing adult romance, I'm just going to move this. Um, so we can talk. Yeah. When I started writing adult romance, uh, I, I drank wine when I started writing sex scenes because I was like, Oh God, that, you know, yeah. that Protestant you just, like, shame. Lock up, right? right? Yeah. Like, oh God, I have to write <laughs> turgid. I just can't. <laughs> I've never written that word. <laughs> right. I'm sure I'll use it in something where I'm just like, well, this is supposed to be evocative. Yeah. <laughs> That's about it. Just stacks on stacks of entendres. <laughs> yeah. No, I could, I could totally see like needing to drink to get through a mm-hmm. sex scene. Like, as a YA author, I don't have too many sex scenes to write, but <laughs> uh, and you know, they're usually like pretty tame when I do. Um, yeah. But the, uh, yeah, even that, I just, I'll sit there and just be blushing furiously. <laughs> I'll just like, I can feel my entire face go about as pink as my hair. And then I'll just like close the laptop and walk away and be like, <laughs> how about that coffee, huh? <laughs> oh, man. I, I don't have a problem anymore. I It's like mm-hmm. I've written uh, like five romance books, so. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I, the problem I do have now is like when I switch back from ro- to YA from romance is my like makeout scenes get a little too steamy. I'm like, oh no, back back up, back up. Right. <laughs> it's definitely been interesting. Um, you know, as as Rachel was talking about, um, w- one of the things that I try to to keep in mind uh, is that the people who are reading my books might be like twelve, um, mm-hmm. and so like while they might be at this at this tender age going and looking up some explicit stuff on AO3 uh, yeah. as you know in a, in a book that you know in a book that I publish um, I have to be mindful that that is like that is going to be exploration that they're doing on their own time looking for stuff to read to educate themselves please don't do it on AO3 children um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, in in terms of a book I feel like that has more of an an idea or conceptually more it's given more of an air of legitimacy whether or not that's true mm-hmm. but um i also have to remember that what i'm writing about might be the first time they've ever read about it mm. so you know it's it's um i was trying to think or in terms of is this something i'm going to be okay with a kid reading when, when it's the first makeout scene that they've ever read about you yeah. know um, and you also have to think about like parents and librarians and, um, and it's like, we talk about with curse words too. It's like a trade-off. Like if you have certain words in your book, it will never make a library list. It will never make a state library list. I had 13 instances of the F bomb in the Merciful Crow and I got them to keep two and they're <laughs> both in the same scene. I think they're like one sentence apart. Yeah. Um, but like I, mean, I, could, well, them. <laughs> I don't know how other states are but like florida especially i know like i've i talked to some other youth services librarians who are like readers for the awards mm-hmm. like they're like this book is great i really want to include it but it has the f word once and i'm not allowed to even put it on the list because of this mm-hmm. one word yeah I know. um and so you'll have to balance that too. Like uh, mm-hmm. what kind of book are you writing? Where, where's your market going to be? Uh, are you heavily reliant on librarians and parents buying your right. book? You know, <laughs> with YA fantasy, I do get to fudge it a little bit simply because like the odds of that making the list, I think tend to be a little bit slimmer, <laughs> but <laughs> so I'm going to just like sprinkle in a couple of F bombs, but <laughs> All right. Well, this has been great. Um, mm-hmm. and you're a great guest to have on, Margaret. I really enjoyed Thank having you. you on. I'm glad you you <laughs> agreed to come. It's been um, so much fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you so much for um, coming tonight. And you can find Margaret's information, again, in the description. So make sure you go check her out on Twitter and Instagram, I think, is what we have there. Yeah, Twitter, yes. Instagram. <laughs> cool. um, and so good night. And I'm just going to close us off with a couple of things. Bye. <laughs> All right. Um, 
thank you so much for watching today. If you're watching the replay, thank you for that. If you're listening to the podcast replay, thank you for listening to the podcast. Um, if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to tell uh, to like and subscribe right down there um, so you don't miss another show. Also, tell your friends because that's how they find out about shows like this. Uh, you can also subscribe to email reminders in the description if you'd like. And uh, the Patreon is also in the description. Patreon supporters of $5 a month get to submit questions ahead of time for our guests. Um, and so you can go and check that out patreon.com slash pub talk live and um upcoming we have wednesday write-ins every week at 8 p.m that's going to continue through december at least um and that's with best Carnan. and then on friday december 4th at 7 p.m so it's friday not saturday and at 7 p.m not 9 p.m um we have the next agent chat live with linda camacho of the galton zacker literary agency so make sure you come out for that because that's going to be um a great chat thank you so much for watching thank you so much to my patreon supporters i love um having y'all you know in in that group and uh I love your excitement. I love the questions that you ask and just want to thank you so much for your support um, because it really helps me <laughs> motivate me uh, to know that y'all uh, love the show. So um, whenever I'm feeling like overwhelmed, <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, and I think that's everything. Um, everyone stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask, and we'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>